Good afternoon, everyone. I can see the numbers are, um, of participants are still um, rising. Um, Loretta, maybe just wait, wait maybe one, one minute or so and let a few others enter and then, um, then we can make a start. Thanks. So Laura, will you operate my slides or should, should I op operate them? I'll, I'll operate them. That's okay, fine. great. Okay. Okay, Loretta, if you want to maybe start. Um, I think we've got quite a few people online now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, welcome everyone to the special side event, which intersects two important high-level processes. My name is Loretta heber Girade, and I am the chief of UNDRR's branch on risk knowledge. And I'm very pleased to be moderating today's session, which is a side event of the 66th Commission on the Status of Women. Today's event will consider how we can achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls in the context of climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. This event also marks World Meteorological Day with its focus theme on early warnings and early action. And it's the nexus between these two themes is what we will explore in today's virtual meeting. We will be looking at how can we achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women through early warnings and early action to reduce disaster risk. There will be a short segment, we hope, for asking questions uh, to our esteemed speakers later on in the program. So do please feel free to submit your questions in the platform Q&A for consideration. It is quite a tight program, so we do hope we will get to your questions, but if not, we will try to answer you at a later date. And do feel free to engage with some of your other attendees on the chat program. Our first high-level speaker today, and we're very, very pleased and proud to announce that the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, has provided a short video statement marking World Meteorological Day on the topic of early warnings and early action. Pierce, that we're having some difficulty with the video. Um, maybe can I, I can ask our colleagues uh, if they can hi, uh, let us know whether or not we'll be able to show the video. Uh, 
Sorry, just two two minutes and some technical issues. Okay. Apologies, uh, everyone online. Um, we're still living in a virtual world, which has many real problems with technology still. So hopefully this will be coming very shortly. Human caused climate disruption is now damaging every region. The most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change details the suffering already happening. Half of humanity is already in the danger zone. Each increment of global heating will further increase the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. That is why we must limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Keeping 1.5 alive requires a 45% reduction in global emissions by 2030 to reach carbon neutrality by mid-century. But according to current national commitments, global emissions are set to rise by almost 14% this decade. The world must end its addiction to fossil fuels, especially coal. At the same time, we must invest equally in adaptation and resilience. That includes the information that allows us to anticipate storms, heat waves, floods and droughts. Today, one third of the world's people, mainly in least developed countries and small island developing states, are still not covered by early warning systems. In Africa, it's even worse. 60% of people lack coverage. This is unacceptable, particularly with climate impacts sure to get even worse. Early warnings and action save lives. To that end, today I announced the United Nations will spearhead new action to ensure every person on Earth is protected by early warning systems within five years. And I've asked the World Meteorological Organization to lead this effort and to present an action plan at the next UN Climate Conference later this year in Egypt. We must boost the power of prediction for everyone and build their capacity to act. On this World Meteorological Day, let us recognize the value of early warnings and early action as critical tools to reduce disaster risk and support climate adaptation. Early warning systems save lives. Let us ensure that they are working for everyone. Well, thank you very much to the Secretary General Guterres for providing that really important message today and making this critical announcement that the United Nations will accelerate action to ensure every person on earth is protected by early warnings within five years. And let me just repeat the Secretary General's words, early warnings save lives. Let us ensure that they are working for everyone. We know that women and girls are often disproportionately not covered by early warning systems. And addressing this issue is a key point for our discussions today. I now have the pleasure to invite the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, Professor Petri Talis, to give his opening statement. He will explain more on how the World Meteorological Organization will be spearheading this effort as announced by Secretary General Guterres and its connections to gender equality and the empowerment of women. Mr. Petri, please tell us. Thank you, Loretta, and thanks for the opportunity to address you. We are today celebrating the World Meteorological Day and, uh, and uh, this is the third event uh, for me for today. I was uh, the Turkish uh, government event this morning and uh, then we have a, a, our own event here in Geneva and, uh, and, and now I'm happy to join you uh, in New York, New York and, uh, and I would like to show you some, some slides uh, concerning uh, where we are with the disaster risk reduction and, uh, and, and climate change and, and also how this is uh, linked to the, uh, the, the gender, gender dimension, which is also very important uh, for WMO. And Laura has promised to operate my slides from, from New York. Could you go to the next one? So this is our vision. So we are at the WMO as a specialized agency on weather, climate, and water. We are working to enhance uh, the availability of data and, uh, and also availability of, uh, of uh, know-how for early morning services. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, we, are, we are supporting our less developed countries, especially in improvement of uh, those services, which is very much in line what, uh, what my friend Antonio Guterres uh, just uh, said and what kind of uh, 
commitment he was uh, asking us to make. Next, please. So we have uh, we are we are we are all facing uh, uh, climate change, and uh, and, and uh, unfortunately the emissions are still growing. And uh, uh, there's an estimation that if we are not uh, successful with uh, mitigation, there we could see even a growth in the in the emissions during the coming coming years uh, by the end of 2030. Uh, although we should see a drop in the emissions uh, by then uh, to, to be able to stay on this track towards. Uh, 1.5 to 2 degrees. There was a slight drop in the emissions in 2019 20 uh, caused by the COVID pandemic lockdowns, but uh, since then we have been returning back to the 2019 emission level and, uh, and, and, uh, and one of our challenges is to enhance the global monitoring of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane and nitrous oxide uh, budgets and, and that would help uh, the countries to, to, to follow what's happening in the in the real atmosphere. We have ground-based measurements, uh, satellite measurements, and uh, and models to simulate the three D uh, behavior of those uh, important gases. Next, please. Uh, then coming back to this uh, uh, this uh, challenge that uh, uh, Guterres just mentioned, uh, we have major gaps in in the basic observing systems, uh, ground-based. Uh, observing systems and the balloon borne sounding observations which are backbone of, uh, of weather forecasting and uh, these reddish colors here on the map uh, indicate the areas where we have major gaps in the observing systems and you can see that it's very much African countries, uh, Caribbean and uh, Pacific Islands and some parts of uh, Latin America especially and, and this means that the quality of the early warning services in those data sparse uh, areas is poor and it's, it's having a negative impact on the accuracy of the forecasts uh, worldwide. Next, please. And we have to invest in, in, in the basic observing systems. Uh, we have a program called SOF uh, for, for that purpose. And, uh, and then we have been also investigating what is the status of uh, our hydrological cycle uh, observing systems. And we have created uh, Water and Climate Coalition, with, uh, it has uh, 10 UN agencies and, uh, and we have a high level panel consisting of uh, heads of state ministers and uh, high level experts from various uh, organizations and, and there our desire is to enhance the hydrological observing systems and uh, early warning services related to uh, drought, uh, flooding, uh, coastal inundation and also to monitor what's happening with the, with the glaciers which are melting and, and availability of freshwater resources to the global rivers. Next, please. The bad news is that uh, we have only uh, only half of our members or less, less than half of our members have proper early warning services in place. And this is especially the case in, in LDC and, uh, and SIDS, uh, SIDS countries. And, uh, and, and only a small fraction of our members are able to forecast the impact of weather events, which is also needed. The most uh, developed countries have such skills and uh, this should be also made available for, for the rest of our members. Next, please. And, uh, and this gender uh, issue is also important for us. Uh, uh, from our, our perspective, uh, uh, we have seen that, uh, that the female ones and children, they are more victims of uh, of uh, high impact weather events, disasters, and, uh, and, and we have uh, even more casualties uh, uh, from uh, female casualties uh, after, after, after a disaster. And that's why we have created a program for gender equity and, and we have a dedicated uh, uh, publication on, on, on that uh, available. Next, please. And, uh, and, and, and this, uh, we, we have also a challenge that, uh, that uh, at, the, at the national level, uh, the expertise in our field is, uh, is uh, quite the male one. Uh, those who are studying physics or mathematics uh, at the universities, uh, they are typically more male ones. And uh, despite of that, we have been trying to improve the situation and we have paid attention to the, to the amount of uh, female experts at our expert bodies. And, uh, and, and we also, uh, we have been lucky that we have just uh, uh, carried out a major reform of WMO, and we have had a chance to hire 
plenty of young experts to WMO, and, uh, and, and there we have a slight majority of uh, female ones who have been appointed. And this gender issue is going to be also important for the multi hazard early warning service conference, uh, which is part of the global platform of disaster reduction, which, which uh, UNDRR will host uh, in Bali uh, in late uh, May. So there also we, we are keeping that, that in mind. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to address you. And uh, thanks, Laura, for organizing this event. And I'd like to wish you happy World Meteorological Day from Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General Talas, for sharing with us WMO's approach to early warning. And we know from all of our data, the critical importance of early warning systems for saving lives from disasters. So this announcement today will really go a long way to achieving our objectives on disaster risk reduction. Um, and to that end, I'm very pleased to let you know that we now have a recorded video statement from the special representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction, Ms. Mami Mitsutori. Excellencies, partners, we know that women are disproportionately impacted by disasters and that there are differences in the ways men and women receive early warnings. More needs to be done to ensure that multi-hazard early warning systems are inclusive and accessible to all. In the context of today's World Meteorological Day event, taking place at the margins of the 66th Commission on the Status of Women, we must reiterate that early warning and early action save lives and livelihoods and reduce disaster losses. Today, we are pleased to launch research undertaking through a Women's International Network for Disaster Risk Reduction with partners from Shifting the Power Coalition and ActionAid Australia. This research draws on lessons from the success of women-led early warning initiatives in Fiji, Vanuatu, and Papua New Guinea to consider how governments, together with other stakeholders, can develop more inclusive and accessible multi-hazard early warning systems. These initiatives show the benefit of empowering women in disaster risk reduction for gender equality, SDG 5, which will be reviewed at this year's high-level political forum. Getting back on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 will require us to work smart to maximize synergies and coherence throughout policy and programs, including embedding gender responsive risk reduction and prevention in their implementation. UNDRR's global platform to take place in Bali, Indonesia also this year is another entry point to promote gender responsive early warning and early action that leaves no one behind. We encourage your active participation in the many plenaries and thematic sessions. UNDRR has already begun the consultations for the midterm review of the Sendai framework, which will culminate in a high level meeting in New York in May 2023. We hope that through the midterm review process, we will reaffirm our collective commitments to effectively prevent and reduce disaster risk, build resilience, and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by promoting gender equality and women's leadership. Looking forward, let us convey the clear message on the importance of gender-responsive disaster risk reduction and inclusive and accessible early warning and early action. Disasters do not have to devastate or discriminate. Thank you. Thank you very much, SRSG Ms. Satori, for that statement. And we are looking forward to hearing more about the research that she mentioned later in this session from our Shifting the Power Coalition speaker. And now we move on to our final opening statement. Now, unfortunately, Her Excellency Ms. Rabab Fatima, the permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations, was unable to join today's event due to an urgent matter. But we are very pleased to hear instead from His Excellency Mr. Monwar Hussain, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations. Mr. Hossan, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Can you hear me well? Yes. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by, I mean, uh, conveying the regrets of Her Excellency Rabha Fatima because she could not attend the event due to you all know that there is an emergency special session on Ukraine is now going on at the General Assembly at the UN headquarters. So uh, she wished to, I mean, she asked me actually to convey her regrets to you. And instead, I mean, she uh, requested me to uh, read on, on her behalf. So at the outset, I thank UNDRR, WMO, IFRC, and the Permanent Mission of Finland for organizing this timely event. The event coincides with the observance of the World Meteorological Day today, which aims to reduce disaster risks by emphasizing on and prioritizing the early warning systems, uh, also incorporating the early actions into this. Um, uh, we need to actually leverage uh, this momentum by involving women in the early uh, warning system that is the global multi-hazard alert system. Uh, due to the reasons that many of the LDCs and, are low, and low lying coastal states and the seats uh, are not actually uh, incorporating women into the decision making and the current preparedness plan. And we all know that, and the many uh, studies uh, reveal that 80% of the people displaced by climate disasters are women and girls. And in addition to that, they are uh, disproportionately affected by the natural disasters as well. However, in Bangladesh, we are trying to do it a bit differently riding on the long experience of, of disaster management through whole of the government, um, uh, through whole of the government approach and also the local level community mobilization, Bangladesh has done a lot, I mean, in managing the disasters. And we are also prioritizing OMEN uh, the, in the DRR plans and strategies and, and has ensured gender equality in these sectors. Our cycle, Preparedness program is a good example of inclusion of women in disaster uh, response mechanism where 30,000 women are working as volunteers. UN has already recognized the program with prestigious UN Public Service Award besides the gender responsive coastal adaptation project uh, and the national resilience program are trying to enhance adaptive capacities of the climate affected people, particularly the women and girls. We are ready to share such good practice practices of Bangladesh with other LDCs and the vulnerable countries. Excellencies and distinguished colleagues, uh, Bangladesh recently co-chaired the preparatory process of LDC 5 conference, which culminated in the adoption of Doha Program of Action, uh, which is a 10-year compact between LDCs and their development partners. One of the six key focus areas of DPOA aims to invest in gender responsive prevention and risk reduction, as has been recommended in the Sendai framework. Allow me to share a few specific thoughts in this regard. First, we need to ensure the inclusion of women and their meaningful participation and leadership in early warning and response mechanisms. Second, enhanced climate financing for mitigation and adaptation purposes is critical for engaging women and girls in the early warning and response mechanisms. Developed countries must fulfill their financing pledges made during the COP26 for achieving this outcome. Finally, transfer of appropriate technologies can facilitate the inclusion of women and girls in the disaster response mechanisms of the coastal LDCs and seeds. The role of North-South and triangular cooperation <laughs> is critical in this regard. As I conclude, uh, let me also, I mean, appreciate the, um, the global uh, multi-hazard system, alert system, which actually uh, urges to, to incorporate the development agencies the disaster management agencies and the weathermen together to for the early uh, the warning and the action system. I thank you all. Thank you very much, Deputy Ambassador Hossan, for your really important perspective on how the government of Bangladesh is prioritizing gender equality in climate and disaster risk reduction efforts, but also for your offer to share your experiences with other LDCs. And I know firsthand that uh, the government of Bangladesh has made just tremendous strides in reducing mortality and morbidity from disasters. So um, I think the lessons that you would be sharing with other countries would be really extremely valuable. So thank you very much. Now we move on to two leading experts from the climate and disaster risk research community to give short presentations on their work related to gender, climate change, disasters, and early warnings. First, let me introduce Dr. Virginie Lemasson, who's the co-director of the Center for Gender and Disaster at University College London, 
to share her top level findings. Dr. Lemasson, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Loretta Hibber Gerardet. And thank you very much to the WMO for the invitation uh, to speak on this high level panel. I will, I will start to speak of a very vast research area. So, in order to stay brief, I will focus on the particular role of weather and climate services for health with a gender perspective. The reason why I'm focusing on health is because it's been uh, highlighted once again by the latest IPCC report that came out a few weeks ago uh, as a critical area. And the report has a particular focus on, um, sorry about this, on um, the uh, necessity for key energy, uh, key sectors to undertake transition in order to make possible the adaptation required to achieve high levels of human and health and well-being, eco economic and social resilience, eco ecosystem health, and planetary health. In that report, um, there is a summary of some of the existing and predicted impacts of climate change on human systems. And I would like to draw your attention on the particular impacts of climate change on health and well-being. Now, strong evidence of the impacts of climate change on key critical health related areas and the negative impact on the occurrence of infectious diseases, heat related risks, malnutrition, mental health and displacement with examples, examples virtually across all the world regions. Now, the connection between gender equality and the health sector is both relevant and necessary for two reasons. The first reason is that a focus on the health sector is a way to highlight persisting gender inequalities. Women dominate the healthcare workforce and they are disproportionately expected to take on both unpaid and paid care roles in almost all societies. On the other hand, um, the healthcare sector and care economies are not often uh, highlighted and identified as priority sectors in indices and in national adaptation plans uh, in the majority of countries, which means they are underfunded uh, with climate adaptation related funding. The second reason why it matters to combine gender equality and attention to uh, the health sector when looking at climate change impacts is that uh, it enables us to better understand the social determinants of health risks because a gender perspective helps us understand people's health status, but also how they access and use health services, as well as how health systems uh, address people's different needs uh, in time of emergency, for instance. And so I would like to share with you uh, an example of the way we try to summarize in a recent uh, research, the connection between the occurrence of climate shocks and stresses with environmental degradation and context of vulnerabilities exacerbated by gender inequalities and how all this combined to create disproportionate impact on human health. And with the example of, of Kenya in particular, we looked at how um, malnutrition, sanitation and waterborne diseases, vector-borne diseases, as well as um, respiratory illnesses were some of the leading cause of mortalities and all of them are exacerbated by climate change and gender inequalities. And so in that situation, weather and climate information services produced by national and international meteorological agencies have a key role to play to uh, document the environmental determinants of health risks by forecasting temperatures and rainfall, for instance, by measuring air quality and by warning against extreme weather events, but also to support different sectors and local authorities to anticipate environmental conditions that aggravate causes of mortality. But for this, a gender responsive approach is paramount in order for this information to be connected to the needs of people working in particular particular sectors and in the health sectors, women have a key role to play in informing what information they need and how they need it in order to better use it, especially in context of emergency. 
So I just want to share these two recommendations for the, from this report that I co-authored with my colleague Rosa Ching from Kenya. And in this report, which is available on the website of the UK Met Office, we emphasize the importance for healthcare workers to be targeted as intermediaries in the production of climate services. And that would help identify information needs and appropriate communication channels, particularly in times where healthcare needs surge, um, for example, in times of drought, but also in times of um, disasters. And then the second recommendation is that feedback mechanisms must be formalized between agencies producing weather and climate information and sectors using it. It's not just the agriculture sector, it's not just disaster risk management, it's also health and, and care sectors. And so I will leave you with that concluding uh, remark that when we talk about empowering women and girls, it's not so much about empowering them because women and girls empower themselves, it's how we can challenge power relations so that when they are empowered and speak out, for example, adolescent girls that raise awareness on climate risk and the dangers of unsustainable development pathways, then we act upon their voices. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. And let me just really underscore how important it is to have this type of research um, because it really does provide the evidence that we need to really promote these gender responsive programming in all the sectors. And I really love the fact that you focus on the health sector in particular. So really, thank you for that excellent uh, presentation. And next to share findings more specifically related to how gender transformative early warning systems can help to empower women and girls in the context of climate change and disasters. I am pleased to invite Dr. Sarah Brown of Practical Action to take the floor, please. One second. Just one second. Um, okay, so um, my name is Sarah Brown, and I'm uh, joining you today from uh, from the UK from Practical Action. Um, and I'm really uh, excited to have this opportunity to talk through some of the work that we've been doing on gender transformative disaster risk reduction, um, particularly taking an intersectional approach to understanding and addressing gender inequality. And the cartoon that you'll be able to see on my screen um, right now emerged from the, the final wrap-up meeting of a programme called the SHEAR programme, which was a six-year programme of science for humanitarian emergencies and resilience. And one of the outstanding questions that, that were posed by, by the team that have worked on that programme, it's a multi-consortium programme, was how do we make sure that our data is good enough to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind in our work on disaster risk reduction? Our approach of how we look to make sure no one's left behind is to make a shift from gender unaware through to gender transformative action. I'm gonna talk you through three steps that, that we see as really critical to that process of moving to gender transformative action. The first step is listening to diverse experiences. When we first started uh, working really in a focused way on gender transformative early warning systems. Um, we began with this study that you'll see um, shown there on gender transformative early warning systems in Nepal and Peru. And that led us to an approach that we've uh, called the missing voices approach, which was an approach to make sure that we are um, reaching out to and listening to individuals who are at risk of being left behind. So individuals facing um, intersecting axes of vulnerability or social marginalization, the voices that uh, are most likely to be left out when we're looking to understand how disaster risk um, affects people. And so our missing voices approach is something that we've then carried forward throughout our work because if we are not listening to and informed by diverse experiences, then 
we're not going to be able to address those needs and make sure that systems work for everyone and for um, uh, people of all genders, um, uh, making sure that the system is really um, working well. The second step is our analysis of gender and inequality. And I'm gonna briefly talk about a piece of research that we did a few years ago for UNICEF, Australian Aid and UN Women on gender and inequality of disaster risk. And this was a global study um, alongside a, a three country deep dive into what data is available and how do we understand differential impacts and differential vulnerabilities and how do we understand the ways in which um, disasters affect uh, women and girls differently. Um, this study at global and national level really highlighted the gaps in the data and how uh, if we take a, um, a, a regular approach to looking at data sets, people will be left behind and we're not gonna capture an, a, a holistic understanding of how people are differently affected. Um, this led us to uh, developing a, a proposed six step approach to gaining uh, much better informed insight into differential impact. And this approach is looking at bringing together the quantitative data that we do have, the qualitative data, inequality data, and adding this additional layer of missing voices data to really develop a sophisticated understanding of differential impact and moving beyond kind of um, simplistic assumptions of, you know, all women are universally and uniformly vulnerable to something much more nuanced and context and hazard specific understanding what are the specific ways in which individuals are at risk and at um, uh, in a situation uh, where, they're, where, where individuals are more likely to be left behind as we move forward with our work on early warning, early action. And then the third piece I wanted to, to highlight today is, is the step of moving from analysis to action. And here I'll just briefly mention uh, some work that we're doing as part of the ASEAN uh, uh, Smart Cities um, Initiative in Baguio City in the Philippines. And there we really had the opportunity to take sort of the three key steps of analysis of how the early warning system is currently working and how people are um, uh, accessing and uh, taking early action through to a policy recommendation piece. And then the final step, taking it into practice. Um, and in that initiative, we've had the opportunity to work really, really closely with uh, municipal uh, and mandated stakeholders at city level, putting policy recommendations into action um, so that the city as a whole can move towards being gender transformative um, its operation. Um, if you go to at practical action, uh, you can access the, the resources I've talked about today. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, I'd love to hear from anyone who's interested. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And I, I have to say what I really loved was that last step of turning policy into practice. That's sometimes what we don't always get to. And that's actually where um, we all want to eventually ensure that our programming, our gender responsive or gender sensitive and gender transformative programming leads us to actual practice in the field. So thank you, Dr. Brown, that was really fascinating. Now it's time for us to take a deeper dive into national and community level experiences in addressing the gender lens and empowerment of women in early warning, early action and disaster risk reduction efforts. And first we have Mr. Amadul Haq, who's the director of Bangladesh's Cyclone Preparedness Program. And what we'd like to know more about is how has the Bangladesh government cyclone uh, program taken action to improve the data and understanding of how cyclones disproportionately affect women and girls in the country? And then what steps have you taken to improve gender sensitive cyclone warnings as a result? So Mr. Hawk, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Loretta. Uh, am I audible? Yes. 
Very much so. Thank you. Uh, good evening from Bangladesh, uh, dear esteemed panelists and dear attendees. In plain words, the economic, social, and cultural context of Bangladesh made the women very vulnerable to natural disasters. The differentiated impact of disaster on men and women was particularly, particularly caused by the long persisting gender-based inequalities. These disproportionate effect, effects can be shown by one comparison. In 1970, the date told female male uh, ratio was 14 is to one. In 1991, it was five is to one. I will show the current picture at the end. However, uh, the gender relation in Bangladesh is under a process of transformation over the last two or three decades as part of economic and social transition. Obviously, political government, our political commitment, our present government plans and policy in place to reduce women's vulnerability, which need meticulous implementation and monitoring, obviously. We understand that portraying women only as victims is a barrier for the change. Rather, they should consider as a force of building equitable disaster resilience. We have seen women play a very vital role in all aspects of risk management, but these are rarely acknowledged and seldom included in the formal system, specifically in our country context. We made a thorough study to evaluate the real thing. What we find, found, the early warning that the women and girls receive often filtered through the male members of that family. The early warning announced by public address system, hardly do women get the full knowledge, full message. They, they rarely see the warning flags posted in public places because they can't reach there. Custodian role of women, it is very important to be noted. Custodian role of the women in family insists them to evacuate as the last person. Women volunteers, we have, but they cannot become fully active as they have responsibility at home. And overall um, response mechanism does not include the needs and priorities of women and girls. And there is pers some perception there. It is also reality. Um, um, uh, the uh, shelter felt, uh, facilities may not educate to meet the needs of women. Many women and girls are reluctant to move uh, in the fear of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes women are considered as recipient of services, not the provider. Women are family manager in normal time, but their potentiality is not considered for management and disaster situation. And of course, there are some social and cultural norms. Those are not friendly to human leadership in disaster. They, the most uh, unfortunate thing, they, the women can decide to move to safe places without the permission of husband or the male member, even when the male are not available at the uh, time of disaster. To, to uh, eradicate the sin, we, uh, we established some guidelines for immediate implementation. We um, suggested women engagement to be increase in early warning dissemination. They should be trained, equipped, and motivated to take a risk, uh, take up the challenging task. Cyclone warnings, uh, flags should be hoisted at appropriate place that uh, more visible to uh, women and girls. Relevant words are to be incorporated in text of early warning message to encourage women and girls to evacuate to shelters. Women volunteers must have functional role in the shelters, particularly the earmark area for women. They should have adequate resources to meet the special needs of women whom they brought to the shelter. And some guidelines uh, was proposed for midterm um, implementation, the policy context, um, uh, gender sensitive and commitment should be there, gender parity in numbers and volunteers, or responders, leadership of women must be established at all hierarchies of disaster risk management. 
women volunteers and the community women should play active roles in the mock drills rather remain passive mm -hmm. observers and more importantly case studies of successful women leadership on disaster management should be documented and shared widely after uh, since our, our effort uh, is undergoing last uh, through last two two to three years what we achieved so far gender balanced volunteer force training and equipment equipping all of them women friendly early warning system developed that is early warning messages are contextualized as the guidelines suggested earlier policy documents are already made women friendly women volunteer leadership cushions are in place Women volunteer from every sub district are getting annually two times recognition from national level. In most cases, we're very fortunate enough. Our honorable prime minister Sheikh Hasina directly handing over the women uh, awards. And what I promise the death ratio, I have shown earlier, now come down to one is to one. And women champions are being portrayed in regular visits in all our documents. I will try to share some context content links in the chat box later. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you. You really just shared such rich experiences from Bangladesh. And you pointed out not only the obstacles that women face, but also some of the really important solutions that you're putting forth. And I also would really like to note that you raised the important issue of the, the fear of gender violence that women face in disaster situations and how that can really be an obstacle to women seeking shelter um, and seeking safe passage. And I, I really appreciate the fact that you, you raised this in today's debate because it's extremely important. Um, we now have Her Excellency Mia Rain, who's the Deputy Permanent Representative of Finland to the United Nations. Deputy Ambassador, at COP26, Finland announced a Euro 30 million funding package for new projects to develop weather and early warning services in developing countries. Could you explain a little bit more about how the gender lens will be integrated in this work? Please. Thank you, Madam Moderator, uh, dear colleagues. And before I answer your question, I just want to thank uh, WMO for hosting the event today. Finland has been partnering with uh, WMO and a number of other organizations and stakeholders in many countries over the past decade to build gender transformative early warning systems and accelerate early action. Uh, research undertaken in countries such as Tanzania and Malawi make a clear case for the need for gender responsive early warning systems. There are significant gender differences that can be seen in how women and men access key assets needed to take early action. For instance, in many countries, early warning information is increasingly being disseminated through mobile phones. But in many locations, men, men, uh, women are less likely than men to own mobile phones or less likely to have funds to purchase data bundles, so-called airtime, to use their phones. In addition, women tend to have less control of the productive assets in the household, such as seeds or other farming inputs, and less of a say in, in the intra-household decision-making process on, uh, on the use of such assets. This means that women are far less likely than men to be able to take early action on seasonal forecasts, even when this information reaches them. So this is why Finland as a donor continues to invest in gender responsive early warning. Uh, we are a convening and a board member of the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership. And uh, we have actively contributed to the report Early Action, the State of Play 2021 that will be launched next week at the MENA Climate Week. Based on the key recommendations of the upcoming uh, report, we highlight first the need to enable local and country level ownership and leadership as drivers of change and entry points for gender responsive action. And then secondly, uh, we highlight the need to build on local and national capacity and to make sure that uh, women's capacities and perspectives are included. So these are key to sustainability. 
The principles of locally led adaptation are important when designing early warning systems at local level. And this includes addressing any structural inequalities faced by women as well, uh, women as well as by youth, children, disabled, displaced, indigenous peoples, and marginalized ethnic groups. Um, at COP26, Finland announced that it is allocating 30 million euros to develop and implement projects to enhance weather and climate services in our partner countries. And we do look forward to continue working with partners to advance this work and ensure that women and girls form a core part of our disaster risk uh, reduction work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so important that the donor countries such as Finland really uh, keep pushing this gender perspective, but also the local, the localization, the local action. I, I rather think that the two go hand in hand to be, to be honest. So thank you very much. And next, we will have one further short presentation from Dr. Virginia Clairvaux, who's the Deputy Permanent Secretariat of the National Security Secretariat of the Turks and Caicos Island Government. Please, the floor is yours. I think you're, uh, Dr. Clairvaux, you may be on mute. I don't hear you. Okay, yes, I was. Apologies right. for that. Right. Are you able to see my presentation now? I don't see your presentation, but I do see you on screen. Uh, okay. Um, I will proceed without the presentation in the interest of some time, but um, we can always share it later. I will be talking about gender lens and empowerment of women in early warnings and disaster risk reduction efforts in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Our presence here is an indication that we all agree that early warning is integral to disaster preparedness, which is central to building the resilience of households and communities to disaster. However, in order for an early warning system to be effective, we agree it must be people-centered. It must ensure that appropriate, applicable, mm. and timely early warning reaches the last mile, including the most vulnerable. In the Caribbean context, through their traditional role as caregivers, household financial managers, knowledge keepers, and networking capacities, engagement of women is indispensable to interventions for community and national disaster risk reduction. The role of early warning interventions to reducing hazard impacts, mitigating disaster risk, and building resilience capacities is underscored. It therefore makes sense that adoption of gender lens is vital to the effectiveness of early warning interventions and by extension, resilience capacity development. In the context of the TCI, initiatives to empower women in the TCI through early warning and early action engagement we have used a number of strategies. The first was the legal framework. Through the Disaster Ordinance 2015, it was drafted to ensure it took into consideration all groups, so it's all inclusive. Gender is mainstream in the National Disaster Work Program of the country. The physical security and integrity of women and men in temporary shelters are also taken into consideration. For example, women, pregnant women in their third trimester are housed in a hospital or clinic. We provide special space in our shelters for single-headed female or women with very small children. Fostering and facilitating gender equality in early warning and early action programs and training. Training is provided in disaster risk reduction and disaster management, and it is offered at times and during different days of the week to ensure equal access by women and men. Working with the Department of Disaster Management, they also work with grassroots women organizations such as what we call Women's Desk or Gender Affairs Department. We also work with non-NG, nonprofit organizations such as the Seraptimus that some of you may be um, familiar with to ensure that whatever activities or initiatives that are being planned 
in the country are sensitive to the needs of women and girls. Through NGOs such as Red Cross, the Ministry of Health provides psychosocial support program, counseling, not just to men and boys, but also to include women and girls. And this type of counseling helped to promote resilience and healing. After a disaster such as the 2017 Irma and Maria impact in the Turks and Caicos Island, um, data collectors are provided with information so that they can refer victims or survivors to the necessary health facilities for further screening or for support. And they are also trained to be sensitive to the cultural and, re and, and religious nuances that exist in the country. I would pause to say that while the Turks and Caicos Islands is small, and this would have come out in the earlier part of my presentation, we have over 190 different nationalities coexisting in a landmass of about 101 square miles. So you can begin to understand the importance of taking different cultural nuances into consideration for disaster risk reduction. Community leaders, church group, pastors are also targeted as part of our early warning system to ensure that all groups are taken into consideration, in particular, the female. Talking about the migrants, the gendered approach to community resilience developed involves an additional, involves an additional dimension in relation to the migrant population. We do know that social and economic sectors of the TCI are heavily dependent on migrant workers who cannot be disaggregated from the disaster risk profile of the country. As such, migrant, our migrant workers are predominantly women as their engagement in early warning and early action initiative is crucial to disaster resilience of not just the household, but the businesses in which they work. Engagement of migrant women by the government or the Department of Disaster Management also has potential for export of positive outcomes as training received and lessons learned is often shared with families in countries of origin. Thereby, generation, it generate a broader impact scope for these intervention. Through, as I mentioned already, through various church groups and local radio stations, we are able to keep the group informed and involved in disaster risk reduction. Wrapping up, warnings are formulated and disseminated. I believe the speakers before me talk about um, using social media and using text messages. We also use this as a means of sending text messages in various languages. While English is the primary language, but also sending it out in English, Spanish, and Creole simultaneously to ensure that regardless of your primary language, that you are able to access the information and you are able to make use of it. Uh, promote, we promote active participation in and lead by women's group in disaster preparedness drills and other planning areas. And recently, following the Irma and Maria events in the Turks and Caicos Island, plans have been, disaster plans and standard operating procedures have been updated to ensure that they are gender responsive, that they are considering the differentiated vulnerabilities that exist in the society of Dirk St. Caicos Islands. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Clairvaux. And I, I really uh, appreciate your comment in particular about the importance of early warning messaging being in the language of the people, uh, the local languages, so that everybody has a chance to access and to understand um, the messaging. So really an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. We are now very honored to have with us Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations Climate Action Team, Mr. Selwyn Hart, who will give us his perspectives before we move on to our final segment of today's session, which is going to look at community-based initiatives. Mr. Hart, please. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. And and excellencies, colleagues and friends, it's definitely a pleasure to speak with you today. And I first wish to extend gratitude to the missions of Bangladesh and, and, and Fiji. Um, and I see the two ambassadors who are on uh, 
DPRs who are on, um, as well as my colleagues from the WMO and UNDRR, as well as the other entities um, that are supporting this important event. And there is definitely consensus on this call that early warning and early action saves lives and protects livelihoods. Just 24 hours of warning of a coming storm or heat wave can cut damage by about 30%. And spending just $800 million a year, um, $800 million on such systems um, in the developing world can avoid losses up to $16 billion a year. And as many speakers before me have highlighted, we're seeing growing inequalities globally within and between countries. And this is the same for early warning systems. One in three persons in the world, mainly in the least developed countries and in the small island developing states are still not covered by early warning systems. In Africa, it is even worse. Six in 10 persons lack coverage. Women are often at greater risk because of a lack of timely and relevant information about impending threats, as well as unequal access to technology that can warn them ahead of these threats and impacts. And this is unacceptable, but it is also low hanging fruit and we can and must act swiftly to close the early warning gap. And this is why today the Secretary General has asked WMO to lead a global effort in achieving 100% coverage of early warning systems within five years and to present a concrete action plan at COP27 in November this year in Egypt that sets out how the WMO and others will be implementing um, this, uh, will implement this ambitious yet achievable goal of 100% coverage. And we need all of you, all of you in this community to really ensure that as we move towards implementing this ambitious goal set by the Secretary General, that the early warning systems and early warning actions um, are gender um, responsive as many of you has, um, have already highlighted today. But in addition to doing all of this, early warning is just one piece of the puzzle. We also need to move on multiple fronts. And many of you have made reference to the recent um, report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which looks at climate impacts and adaptation and vulnerability. And there's no nice way of putting it. The world is way off course from meeting its climate goals. Global emissions are moving in the opposite direction. And the window of opportunity to limit global temperature increase to 1.5 is rapidly closing. The reality is that if you live in Central or South America, if you live in East, Central, or West Africa, if you live in South Asia, or in a small island developing state, you are living in one of the global hotspots as it relates to the climate crisis. And if you're living in one of these areas of high vulnerability, you're 15 times more likely to die from a climate impact. Yet these countries and regions have contributed least to the climate crisis. And we know that in these countries and in others, women are disproportionately, disproportionately impacted by climate extremes and climate impacts. So this 15, if you're living in one of these countries or regions, you're 15 times more likely. But if we were to disaggregate this um, data according to gender, we would obviously see that women are more, um, um, significantly more um, impacted in terms of mortality. So, the report of the IPCC also shows that we are significantly underinvesting in adaptation and resilience building measures. So we must urgently, urgently, and I stress urgently here, 
pursue emission reductions, rapid emission reductions, while simultaneously scaling up and increasing investments um, on adaptation and resilience building. At COP26 in Glasgow last year, developed countries committed to double adaptation finance by 2025, moving from roughly about 20 billion to at least 40 billion a year by 2025. This is a useful start, but as the Secretary General has emphasized, it is still not enough. However, by COP27, developed countries must demonstrate in a very transparent manner how they intend to scale up adaptation finance over the course of the next 33 months. Lives are at stake. We also need credible and rapid actions that reform access and eligibility systems and also address the needs of the vulnerable of vulnerable communities and countries, and in particular, the added risk that women face. As the Secretary General said on Monday in a speech on climate, we are sleepwalking to a climate catastrophe. It is also clear that we will not accelerate this transition and build resilience unless all of humanity, men and women, girls and boys, are fully empowered. It is the vision and determination of women leaders who made the Paris Agreement possible and their continued and expanded leadership that will make its implementation possible. So I thank you and please continue to raise the flag of ambition on this issue. Rest assured you have our full support and we will need you and we need you more than ever over the course of the coming weeks, months and years to ensure that we can, can make this planet livable and that all of humanity can be empowered and um, be on a pathway to not only meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, but also the Sustainable Development Goals. I thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for what is essentially a call to action, um, for emphasizing the commitment of the United Nations to fast track efforts, five years, so that everyone can benefit from early warning systems. But at the same time, we must urgently stop the warming of the planet that is leading to these increased disaster risks that requires the early warning systems. And of course, gender, as you pointed out, must really be at the forefront of these efforts. So your remarks have been uh, highly appreciated, Mr. Hart. We now move to the last part of today's program. And this is really where I think early warning becomes so critical and that's at the community level. And what we're looking at is how community-based initiatives can really help us reach the last mile uh, and particularly how they reach the most vulnerable communities. So our next two speakers will explain how their work is helping to bridge the gap between vulnerable communities and national warning services. First, we have Sharon Bagwan Rolls, who's the regional manager of the Shifting Power Coalition in the Pacific. Ms. Bagwan Rolls, you created or co-created the Women's Weather Watch in Fiji which is an interoperable system. You also supported its adaptation in Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea. And this helps ensure that information on weather patterns reaches communities in remote areas, including women, of course, but also that evacuation strategies are gender inclusive and that women are involved in disaster preparedness management and response. And uh, we'd like to know a little bit more about what benefits the Shifting the Power Coalition in the Pacific has found from integrating this gender lens into early warnings and disaster preparedness, but also what would be your advice to our listeners on how civil society can really help support that bridging of the gap between national efforts and local communities? Please. Thank you, um, Loretta. Shifting the power in the midst of the climate crisis has meant organizing to ensure disaster management systems and climate action work in line with member state obligations to gender equality, disability inclusion, and women's rights. And this approach is in line with CEDAW, with ICRPD, the Beijing Platform for Action, our own Pacific Platform for Action, 
um, WPS resolutions, the Sendai framework, as well as the WMO and UNFCCC gender action plans to uplift and strengthen women's traditional knowledge and innovation for gender transformative action. In 2009, the um, co-creation of the Women's Weather Watch model in Fiji happened because after a disaster, when I met with rural women leaders who knew when and how to prepare to reduce risks in their homes and farms, um, they weren't in decision making. They relied on radio for weather alerts, but were not being consulted or included in decision making on how the information is disseminated to support their preparedness and protection. It evolved from a simple SMS platform for rural women to an innovative information communication system that monitors approaching storms and disaster management in communities so that these are designed to be able to use real time information, as well as being an, an advocacy platform for the involvement and consultation of women in disaster management and humanitarian relief efforts. Through the coalition, this model, as you said, has been adapted with ActionAid Vanuatu, now managing the Woman Wet and Weather platform, supporting young the Vanuatu women to learn about weather patterns, understand reports coming from the Met office, and develop early warning messages to inform their communities of impending cyclones and other extreme weather events. In two, uh, 2021, the model was adapted in Papua New Guinea to respond to the COVID crisis, disseminating more than 5.6 million SMS alerts to over 1 million people on conflict on COVID prevention, as well as the prevention of gender-based violence. So we can see from these examples that women-led early warning information and communication mechanisms have a dual impact in delivering access to information for communities to better prepare for extreme weather events and health emergencies and support the realization of gender equality. It says, well, it, it explains what we mean as women when we say information is power. Power to access information from MET services in a way that works for us. So understanding technical terms of early warning and climate services and helping the MET services understand the diverse needs of communities, including persons with disabilities. The power to combine traditional and indigenous knowledge to get early warning information to local women and community leaders to enhance preparedness in coastal villages, remote communities, and to vulnerable groups, especially those with disabilities and the LGBTQI community to get information out in local dialects and open up channel, uh, channels of information for rapid response and recovery. So the publication today that's been launched is providing all of these insights in line in particular with CEDAW General Recommendation 37, which could then actually help contribute to building disaster literacy and increasing access to climate services and information. This all results in increasing local women's engagement, the use of the information to develop and promote climate adaptation strategies, um, to be able to play that critical role in the feedback of information from local networks. But we've got to make the structures work for us. So this is the how. Ensuring that financing mechanisms sustain and scale up women-led models that are supporting learning and collaboration models, particularly those investing in diverse young, uh, young women to learn and use traditional indigenous knowledge and climate science from MET officers, to make available appropriate and accessible information with and for persons with disabilities, and to invest in the leadership and agency of women as key resource people in building community resilience, whether it's managing food security, water or health security? And how do we also make sure that these resources are also scaling up our existing funding models as well? So learn from us also in the way we are working to get the resources to the women on the ground in the way that they need it. And finally, I can't say enough about appropriate and accessible technology. It's an accelerator of change for women uh, by looking at the initiatives that are 
uh, featured in the in the publication. It's about amplifying our voice and outreach, as well as enabling our leadership. And it's platforms that can be vital for participation, prevention, and protection across different hazards from cyclones to COVID-19. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you very much, uh, very rich. And I really also appreciate the fact that you brought up the importance not only of the role of women in communities, but indigenous knowledge and what a critical uh, role that plays in developing effective early warning systems. And also the importance of making sure that we're reaching disabled people, which are often, we know, and we've seen it uh, recently, not able to access early action and uh, evacuation services. So really you've raised so many important points, um, but we are running short on time. So I better move on swiftly. And I do invite uh, colleagues to remain on the line. I know we're gonna go slightly over our time, but we have two more very important speakers. So please do stay on. Uh, our second community perspective is from Ms. Stella Steven, who is the monitoring and evaluation officer of the Duraja Inclusive City Community Forecasting and Early Warning Service Partnership in Tanzania. Now, Daraja, which means bridge in Swahili, is delivered by resurgence with key partners and supports informal settlements to access, understand, and act on climate information and early warnings. So, Stephen, could you explain a bit more about how Daraja has helped bridge the gap between national warnings and these often very highly vulnerable communities, which are informal settlements? especially women, and what role did women have in leading this initiative? And how are you attracting more women to get involved? Please. Thank you, Loretta, and thank you for having me in this platform. So Daraja played a role of uh, ensuring that the producer of the information, which is Tanzania Meteorological Authority, together with the uh, community in very vulnerable informal settlement, which are the use of information and other intermediaries, to come together and understand what are the gaps, the important gaps, and what are the needs of the community, so that the the together the platform can uh, can come up with a with a respond on those gaps, and um, in ensuring that uh, women were a part of the of the process in the core designing, I can excite some of the examples. Uh, women were able to share that uh, they are more impacted because when it, it, it is there is a disaster, you find that they are at home compared to men who are usually work away from home, but their business, most of the informal settlement, particularly in Dar es Salaam, you find that women uh, have uh, home-based business, so you find that they are affected. But he, Something of interest is the accessibility of this information, the weather information to women. You find that uh, the common channel used here is radio and television, and women, they don't have access to those channels. So through uh, discussing together with uh, technical staff from TMA, the users of information, the intermediaries within the city of Dar es Salaam, we are able to come up with a pilot project uh, through the core design approach, where we identified how can we make sure the information is accessible and one of the suggestions which came up from the women itself, it was into using the women groups within the informal settlement, because this is the social network, which can be a large scale, but using the school children by forming uh, school clubs, using the SMS as well as the media. And through using this channel of communication, you could see that women were able uh, to respond, to make a decision on safety issues. They are able to escort their children to schools and repairing their houses, even relocating their business when there is a disaster from high affected area to more uh, safe areas. And how do, we res how do we make sure that women play a big role in this project? First, women were able to provide their input. It means their needs within the project were incorporated by ensuring that they are able to access the information and not only uh, to access the information, but also to understand the information. We went through the technical languages, which are not understood by majority of the vulnerable groups and simplify them in a way that they are able to be understood but also work together on, the, on developing the downscaled information that uh, makes sure that the information is reliable to the community and they are able to, to take action. 
Another aspect where the community played a vital role is, is in the data correction. We had the team of uh, monitoring team. Uh, at least you have a small team of 10 people and among these six were women. These were women who are not only collecting the information, but at the same time, educating the people at the household level on what they should do in case of disasters such as floods and extreme heat. The community, especially women, played a big role in information dissemination. As I have said that uh, we had 25 women-led groups who are involved in disseminating the information within the settlement. But also the facilitation role were highly where among, for example, on the school, we had 13 teachers who were trained and among them were nine uh, women. These teachers were facilitating to make sure that they are getting the information from the met agents. They are relaying, relaying the information into the school clubs and these school club were able to announce what is next on the weather information and take back the information to their parents and they take the, the, the action. So able to respond to the needs of the community. And you mentioned how do we make sure that women are participating. I think the first and the most important thing is to respond to their needs. If someone is seeing that the, their needs are not responded to, it means the interest is very low. So understanding the community needs and develop the action that responds to their needs. But to make sure that the information is reliable as well as pick up. For example, we use the focus group discussion where we discuss with the women to understand their needs, to understand their recommendation and how they can participate in the whole uh, project. But also I'm working with the organization which has been working with uh, women almost for, for more than 15 years. We used the women champions, where the, those women who are able to speak up, then they go to the community and encourage other women to speak up, to encourage other women to take different roles within the project. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you're, your project really demonstrates the importance of engaging women in all aspects of uh, the project design, really listening to them and making sure that it's responsive to their needs, as you pointed out. So that was really an excellent, I think, um, uh, example of how we can make much more gender responsive programming in the field. So finally, our last speaker today is Dr. Asha Mohammed, who's the Secretary General of the Kenyan Red Cross. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, you have great experience on the front line working to educate women and girls on the impacts of climate change, but also empowering women when it comes to local leadership and decision making on climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Can you tell us how you've been able to ensure that the voices of women and girls are included in climate and disaster related decision making in Kenya, and how does empowering women and local leadership help local communities improve their disaster and climate resilience. Dr. Mohammed, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Loretta. And uh, maybe let me start by apologizing that uh, I'm a little bit out of town and having uh, some connection problems. So allow me not to use my video so that I can keep the connection for some time. Um, in Kenya, approximately 70% of the disasters are hydrometeorological in nature, particularly droughts and floods. And we have continued to see increased frequency and magnitude over the years, uh, which leaves no time actually for communities to recover. Uh, women and girls, as has been said also by some of the previous speakers, uh, continue to be disproportionately affected by the impact. Uh, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement recognizes the unique role women play in their communities and also see them as agents of positive change. Therefore, we also acknowledge that their voices need to be included in the development of climate and disaster risk reduction solutions. At the Kenya Red Cross, our programs look to empower women to build their capacities through their participation and engagement in various areas, uh, including assessments, policy discussion, and also at the local level in terms of implementing committees. When we conduct vulnerability and capacity assessments as part of resilience building and needs assessments after a disaster, there is a special focus on collecting data and information on women and girls and ensuring that they actually take part in the process. 
Additionally, also during formulation of policy and legislation of disaster risk management and climate change, women are mobilized to contribute in the public participation forum, but also to just ensure good representation during the drafting sessions. We have been able to engage uh, women leaders in parliamentary caucus on disaster risk management to ensure also adequate representation of issues. At the community level, we ensure that the committees that are developed um, also have women uh, represented. So having a balanced membership in these committees and also that women actually get appointed to leadership positions. And I think over time, we've seen some good progress. Uh, and um, I don't know whether it's coincidental, but it seems like many women get actually elected to be treasurers, which is uh, a very good uh, <laughs> uh, confirmation of trust that they actually can take good uh, care of the resources of the, of, the, of the community. But also through platforms such as what we call the Risk Informed Early Action Partnerships, uh, which is hosted by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Cross Societies, uh, we continue to highlight the need uh, for risk information to be delivered in ways that uh, mean it can be acted upon by vulnerable communities and people. And these kind of initiatives actually uh, convene a broad range of actors around the critical topic of empowering women in early warning and early action. Uh, just to conclude on the second part uh, of your question is just to say that uh, we continue to see firsthand the benefits of involving women. Uh, they have deep rooted knowledge on natural resource management and therefore uh, very important that women are engaged uh, and they can be uh, part of uh, the team to promote uh, different uh, aspects, for example, climate smart agriculture, water resource management and the famous use of efficient cooking stoves and others. But uh, more important, I think having women in leadership also enhances equal access to opportunities. So the Kenya Red Cross advocates for women's inclusion. And we look at leadership opportunities at every level through our work and programs. Uh, we've seen women's leadership uh, leading to improved outcomes for our climate related projects. Uh, we have, for example, an economic security project uh, at the coast of Kenya, where women groups were supported to establish village savings and loan associations as alternative uh, means of livelihood. And this empowered women uh, having greater control on their finances, supporting food security, and building their resilience to climate change and supporting their uh, communities and families uh, through these livelihoods. So finally, uh, just to finish to say yes, that uh, clearly when policies uh, or projects are implemented without women's meaningful participation, uh, existing inequalities continue to increase and the effectiveness of these projects decreases. So I'll leave it there because of time uh, and thank you very much for having me today. Well, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Mohammed, for wrapping up what has been a rather fast paced roundtable of perspectives that has provided, in my view, really rich insights for gender mainstreaming work on early warning and early action. And as we've heard, we really have some excellent examples to build on as we move together to ensure that no one is left behind in early warning systems. And we achieve that really important goal of 100% coverage in the next five years. A video recording of this session and the presentations will be made available on the WMO website. And we invite all of you to remain engaged with the key upcoming processes. Thank you again. And we do wish you a fruitful remainder of the CSW 66. Goodbye. <laughs>